I'm the executive director for the League of Oregon Cities. Uh, welcome to this Friday's legislative webinar. I know most of you are probably veterans at this by now, so this will seem repetitive, but just a few friendly reminders. Please keep yourself muted during uh, today's webinar unless you're specifically asked to unmute. It will help us control background noise. If you've not yet done so, it would be helpful if you could change your screen name to your name, position, and the organization you represent. Reminders that this webinar is a public space. It's open to all, and it is, in fact, being recorded for future use. We will hold all questions until the very end, and when it's time to take questions, we will prioritize city members over members of the general public. We will end the webinar today no later than 1 o'clock p.m., and you can follow all of the LOC's legislative activities as well as everything that we do for and on your behalf on our website at www.orcities.org. So what are we going to talk about today? We've got quite a few things that we want to highlight for your information. We're going to start um, today talking about a phar pharmacy subsidy bill that could potentially impact some cities. We're going to have several issues to discuss related to housing and homelessness, in particular the governor's housing bill, the state's housing budget, and the Oregon Mayor's Association's Homelessness Task Force funding request. We will talk about portions of the drought package. Uh, we will remind people about some broadband surveys related to the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. We'll discuss economic incentives and where they stand right now with the legislature. And we're going to conclude with a recap of where local governments stand generally as we approach the end of this current legislative session. So we have a lot to talk about today. Um, I think almost every single one of our lobbyists will be presenting at some point. So let's kick off first with pharmacy subsidies. Uh, Scott Winkles, I saw Scott turn his camera on. I think everybody should know Scott by now, but just in case he is our general government lobbyist, he works regularly on all of those administrative matters that impact your cities. And Scott, I think today you're going to talk to us about House Bill 3013, which is a bill related to pharmacy subsidies. Can you explain generally what that bill does and why our city should care about it? Um Sure. Uh, if I if I could first go into my normal segment on this show and give the update on the walkout, um, uh, I'll just let it will be really really quick. Um, you know, talks are ongoing. Um, I don't think uh, anybody can really tell you right now what's happening. I think the the thing that does change. I think people are starting to feel that this is a real implication. Uh, the potential for, for uh, signing, going into signing die without a budget is now real and people are talking more. Um, I remain skeptical that there will be a deal, um, but uh, uh, hope springs eternal. And, you know, we could, we could see talks. I think the conversations right now really aren't at the leadership level, they're at the Senator on Senator level. And uh, that may, change the, 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 the dynamic a little bit. I do know that DOJ has been working on sort of how to address what happens next. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, stay tuned. We may see some developments next week, um, but, uh, 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 you know, believe uh, lots of rumors, lots of things being reported out there, lots of things being said on social media, but I think uh, we can believe it when we see senators in seats at this point. So on to House Bill 3013. Uh, so this bill uh, is uh, very concerning uh, from a human resources standpoint and cities as employers. Uh, what the bill does is it uh, seeks to place some additional regulations on your pharmacy benefit managers. And pharmacy benefit managers are they're, they're enterprises that sort of help manage and control savings on prescription drugs. Uh, prescription drugs are one of the highest cost drivers for your health insurance benefits. Um, you know, we know in the CIS pool that he's next going in the next fiscal year, they're getting hit with about a 5% on average increase in the Regents plan on 11% on the Kaiser plan. So it's, this is real dollars that are, are coming out the door. Um, and what the bill does is it seeks to protect the pharmacy, the pharmacies uh, and ensure that they're, they remain economically viable which in concept isn't something that I don't think the league would ever engage. We, we would prefer to be out of this conversation. Uh, however, the way this is done uh, is to uh, increase the dispensing fee. So every time CIS fills a, a prescription or any, any plant fills a, a prescription, the pharmacy is paid a dispensing fee. Right now, uh, CIS has about 283,000 prescriptions for 21,000 covered lives. 
and uh, uh, we pay about two bucks per for that 283,000 prescriptions. Uh, under this bill, that fee would go up to about, would increase by about $10 um, on, on average. So you're talking about, about a $2.8 million increase just to the prescription drug plan uh, from this one component of the bill. Uh, very concerning. I think the cities that are per, that are self-insured or they're purchasing from a broker through the market, uh, they're looking at similar, would be looking at some similar increases. Uh, and I think the Kaiser, if you're on a Kaiser plan, I think they have, they, they operate a little bit differently, but they also do have some concerns with this bill. Um, and more broadly, uh, no one really understands and the fiscal discussion on this bill has been very stilted and very uh, uh, incomplete. And I don't think there's a lot of understanding of actually what this does to the health insurance marketplace. And so you know, CIS, we, we have to insure our retirees in our pool with our actives, which isn't really common uh, among employer plans. And so our, our seniors are actually gonna, our retirees who, are, who, are, who, who pay full freight for their benefits are are really going to suffer uh, if we see, uh, particularly if they have chronic conditions, which you know most people after they retire they do have something going on. Uh, uh, they're going to be hit, you know, up to ten to fourteen dollars for each script at the register. And so we are asking members to call their legislators and say and to table this bill for this session, you know, regardless of the walkout scenario, but, and uh, uh, really uh, stop and think about how your how this attempt to get at PBMs is really hitting the people who pay the premiums, which are the employer and the employee and, and, and retirees. So uh, it's a very uh, you know, concerning piece of legislation. There are some other components of it that I don't think we, we would be fine with, such as none of our business if DCBS wants to license PBMs. Um, uh, you know, there's some transparency issues that's not our issue. It's when they seek to subsidize the pharmacist to uh, from the PBM or subsidize the pharmacist uh, with this fee and put it on to the, the payer. So that is the concerning concept. That is very concerning to us. And um, I hope that you can uh, take a look at the bulletin article. And if you could reach out to your legislators and, and voice your opposition, that would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, Scott. And just to clarify, because you're knee deep in this issue and others may not be, when you say PB, PMB, who are you referring to? PB, I'm sorry, PBM, it's a pharmacy benefit manager, and it's a, uh, a sort of a broker, and they help manage uh, uh, prescription costs. Thank you. And just to yeah. clarify, the league's asking that we kind of table this, not because we disagree with the goal, but because we disagree with the financial impact it will have on our membership. Is that fair? That's fair. I think they aimed at the PBMs and hit us. Okay. Excellent. And that House bill number, just to remind everybody, is 3013? Correct. Excellent. And Scott will put his information in the chat and it's in the bulletin if you've got more questions about what this means and how you can help us try and make sure this bill doesn't become law this year. Um, so thank you to Scott. We're going to pivot now to one of our most talked about issues all session um, and probably for years, and we're going to focus on housing. Um, I'm going to ask Ariel Nelson to put her camera on or unmute herself. I see her coming on. Everybody should be very familiar with Ariel. She's been quite busy this session. Ariel, I think that you've got a few updates for us today, starting with the governor's housing bill, telling us where things stand with the OMA homelessness funding task force request, and then probably just generally where things stand with the state of the state's housing budget. So what do you have for us today? Thanks, Patty. Hi, everyone. So the governor's housing bill is House Bill 3414. Uh, that bill is continuing on. Um, we are now up to the Dash 19 amendments, which received a public hearing yesterday in the House Rules Committee. Uh, the first, the Dash 19 amendments combine two concepts. The first concept is the kind of what we have been tracking in this bill all along, which is a requirement that all cities approve requests for adjust, ad, adjustments for housing development. Um, we have very uh, closely negotiated this bill to get it to a place that's at least workable for cities. I think a lot of, um, particularly our, our 
uh, local city planning experts um, are really uncomfortable and disagree with kind of the policy direction of this bill. There are many things that we oppose, uh, but the negotiations that we've been part of at least get it to a place that will be more workable for cities. It also sets up uh, a housing, a statewide housing accountability production office, which will um, investigate and take complaints of um, how cities are potentially uh, implementing state housing law potentially incorrectly and have um, uh, ultimately enforcement action that begin with technical assistance and outreach. And there is $10 million um, included in that office for uh, technical assistance capacity updates for cities to do work to update their codes. Um, so that piece um, is in the dash 19s. There are still some technical uh, fixes. We are still trying to get potentially over this weekend related to how the new adjustments are appealed and how the um, how complaints and appeals will work through uh, the this proposed office versus uh, existing processes with LUBA, the Land Use Board of Appeals. So we are working with um, some special legal counsel to try and get that feedback in. Um, the new piece in the Dash 19s that received, they only had heard public testimony yesterday on this new piece, is incorporating um, what has been introduced in previous sessions and was worked on this session, most folks know it as Senate Bill 1096 for um, land supply, or in other words, um, it's a it's kind of a special side uh, process for UGB expansion. Um, and this is a concept that the LOC supports. Uh, we've worked with the home builders and the Oregon Property Owners Association on improving their original concept that we had opposed in previous sessions. Um, so this is a um, kind of an alternative UGB expansion process. You have to meet certain parameters to do it, and it's entirely optional for cities. So a city can uh, can apply to go through this process, or uh, a property owner developer can do it, but they have to have the agreement with the city, um, and there has to be a, um, a concept plan um, and specific types of diverse housing types and affordability measures are, are included in that concept plan. You can only bring it up to bring in certain amounts of acreage depending on the size of your city and there's certain density requirements depending on your location. Um, so if I can go, there's many more details to it, but I'm happy to uh, answer those questions uh, later or offline if you're interested. So the LSC testified in support for specifically those sections of the bill related to land supply yesterday. Our official position on the entire bill is neutral uh, with um, significant implementation concerns on the record and we're pursuing additional hopefully changes uh, over the weekend. Um, the bill just had a public hearing yesterday. It has not had a work session to get a vote to move anywhere or kind of get further approval. So we're anticipating that may happen next week, maybe Tuesday, um, before we're hearing things may start to shut down in the committees. So that's House Bill 3414. Um, and then moving on from there, uh, in terms of the Oregon Mayor's Association funding proposal, um, we've known for some time that we weren't going to see that proposal funded in that same form or in full due to the, the revenue forecasts and also the governor's uh, emergency declarations and shelter and homelessness plan moving forward early in the session. Uh, we did see some, uh, we have seen some updates um, on what the legislature is looking to approve this session. The Oregon Housing and Community Services, that's the housing agency, uh, their budget bill, Senate Bill 5511, um, has been uh, finalized. Uh, it went. It moved out of the subcommittee, and I believe out of Ways and Means this morning. Um, and there uh, was significant funding in there to support continued implementation of the governor's emergency order. So you may remember there was early funding that was approved in House Bill fifty nineteen, um, already uh, passed and signed by the governor earlier this session. That's to stand up additional shelters, expand shelter capacity, rapid rehousing, and some emergency rent assistance. The um, significant significant funding we saw in the OHCS budget this week will is continued operations and support to, um, to continue those efforts and support that capacity going forward. There's also um, some funding for existing or for operations gaps for previously approved uh, navigation centers and project turnkey shelters. What we were looking for and didn't see in this budget is we have a handful of cities who stood up shelters um, with our federal ARPA, one-time federal ARPA dollars, um, and we'll need uh, ongoing operations starting in 2024. Um, we did not see that in this budget. We understand that the funding that is there for shelter is limited to, limited to things that the legislature specifically stood up 
However, we are hearing um, there's a chance we may see that funding in um, what's called a program change bill. It's one of the standard uh, end of session bills uh, with, with lots of budget odds and ends. So we are we expect to see that bill as well as what's known as the Christmas tree bill and other um, end of session budget bills uh, maybe posted Sunday night, early next week, Monday, Tuesday. Um, the governor is prioritizing that shelter gap funding, at least in the amount of 10.5 million. Um, and so that's still, we know at the top of her list, it's not everything we think should be in there. It should be additional. Um, so depending on what we see come out um, in the final budgets or final proposed budgets next week, um, we may be looking at um, continued advocacy into the short session or at an emergency board budget, interim budget hearing in the future. Um, the other piece that's happening uh, behind the scenes that hopefully many of you are aware of, and there are additional communications going out this week and later today, is um, Oregon Housing and Community Services is hard at work implementing the governor's emergency order on homelessness. Um, so for the, the cities that are part of uh, specifically named in the emergent, the governor's emergency order that are, ha have multi-agency collaborative MAC groups, those plans are underway. But for the majority of communities, majority of cities um, that are in the balance of state, rural Oregon continuum of care, that's uh, 26 counties, um, the agency is working on setting up how they're going to be allocating that funding. And so hopefully many of you are aware they're, they're moving towards a new kind of um, system where they're establishing what are called local planning groups. And that's basically an umbrella term for things like a House Bill 4123 pilot, which many of you are a part of, or the MAC, or it could be a MAC group like in the emergency areas. But the attempt is to provide more meaningful regions for allocations of funds because the ROC, the rural Oregon continuum of care is, you know, most of the state. And that's not a meaningful region or a meaningful way to plan for addressing homelessness, right? So they're, they're, they've had some listening sessions over the past couple of weeks. They're gonna do a little bit more. They're open and available for your outreach. They have a team of staff available. I just had a great meeting yesterday with an OHCS staff person and um, Mayor Villalpando from Vail who's been participating and kind of, they're really looking for um, LSC and ASC's guidance and how to get our membership in, involved. And this is a direct result of the OMA's leadership in putting that proposal out there. Cities are very much on the map and seen as critical partners and leaders in implementing the governor's uh, executive orders. Um, and these local planning groups will be set up for this initial round of emergency funding, but they are planned to be the structure going forward. So any future funding, future programming, that's really the direction the state and the agency is looking to go, and they're looking to do that in partnership with you. So this may be something that you feel your provider is handling, your service provider, or that your county commissioner is handling. That is great, but we want to make sure whether you're in the driver's seat, you have specific needs, uh, specific opportunities, specific ideas, or you simply want to be kept in the loop so that you can be letting your community know what's happening, your constituents know. Um, this is really important information. So it is a little bit rushed coming out of OHCS. They are on a very aggressive implementation timeline. They recognize it doesn't feel very realistic, but we have to start somewhere. And I think the critical piece here is that cities are a key partner in this work. And so um, I encourage you to reach out to me and I'll get some additional resources out on how to plug into that um, those developments. Thanks, Ariel. A few follow-up questions of my own. Um, so with the balance of state, would it be fair to say that there are several of those pilot programs that are located in the balance of state who should, in fact, be communicating heavily with OCHS right now about funding their already established regional collaborations. Yes, and that's the plan. And I believe they're all at the table. There's at least a, one representative from each pilot that's plugged in, if not, you know, all folks bring that information back and forth. So the key here is how how to kind of not interrupt the work and the progress of the established pilots while also considering the region around them, because the, the state's also not in a position to have like a million different grantees or fiscal leads. And there's there's really good discussions going on about kind of different roles for different entities and kind of who's taking the lead. And it's not necessarily you know, etched in stone, but it's for now. And it, we're just kind of, they're trying to establish more meaningful regions around the state. And absolutely, the 4123 pilots are are a really important model and they want to continue uh, to support them and not interrupt that progress and help build on that. And then also you had mentioned that this ties in with the leadership from the OMA Homelessness Task Force. 
would it be safe to say that for those cities that are located in the balance of state who put together a one pager in support of that task force, they should be reaching back out to OCHS and once again restating what's in their one pager and championing for funds to be directed towards their region and community? That's correct. Okay. Um, and then last catch back to the governor's bill, just so it's it's kind of clear. This is a bill that we're neutral on because it contains pieces we don't like and pieces we do like, and we're trying to thread a pretty difficult needle while still working for changes. That's that's right. And I think the other reason is that, um, you know, for those of you who are tracking or may remember, we put out a series of action alerts and uh, cities really strongly have responded. You all really strongly responded. Maybe I, I've lost track of time, but it was maybe a month ago. We were in the in the universe of the Dash 5 and the Dash 6 amendments, and the Dash 5 were the proactive amendments that LOC proposed because the structure of the bill as, as introduced was just completely unworkable as the governor was trying to do it. And we have the leadership of Representative Mark Gamba, Gamba a former mayor, to thank for that. He sponsored the Dash 5s. Um, and what we've been negotiating ever since that point has been a version, the structure of the Dash 5s that LSE proposed. And so we're recognizing that there was a significant shift in the policy and the framework of the bill um, that LSE asked for and we got. So it's it's we're not in a position to be completely opposed to the bill, but we're also not letting go of continued technical. Um, I mean, they're, they're less major compared to the the, sh the shift that we saw, but we're still going after them. We still want this to be implemented appropriately, um, but it's, it's going to be difficult, particularly with running out of time, the legislature winding down. Perfect. And one last question, Ariel. Um, is there anything that you need from the membership to be doing with the governor's housing bill right now? I don't think so. It's um, pretty much at the tail end. Um, I think the main thing is, you know, we expect to see this bill get wrapped into whatever packages they agree to move forward in the special session. And at the very least, it will come back in a short session. Um, so it's really important that we've negotiated it to this point and gotten it improved to this point. What we will be needing to do is really carefully tracking how implementation goes and where there are problems and issues for cities for implementation or really bad results of, of things that are cities are being forced to approve or just impacts to your communities. That's where we're going to want to have really good information and data so that we can come back. There is a reporting requirement and LOC is specifically not required to produce a report like DLCD is, but invited to the legislative report to specifically from the city perspective, not the state's version of the city's perspective, but the LOC is saying this is what's happening on the ground. So I'll be definitely reaching back out. Um, the adjustment portion of the bill, the effective date, if this passes, isn't until January. So that gives cities a little bit of time to figure out how this is going to work. So we will probably be needing to help with like a webinar or some guidance in advance of that. Um, and then the housing office gets stood up in uh, April of 2024. And so they'll, it'll be some time before we have um, impacts, but that'll be something in, in the next year, two to three years to be watching closely and coordinating with us on. Awesome. Thank you, Ariel. You can take a breath for a little bit, I think. Um, we'll just at least a short session. I'm sure there's more committee hearings and work sessions for you. But Ariel Nelson, Housing and Land Use Lobbyist, if you don't already know her, you probably should. We're going to pivot to another topic that's of paramount concern, particularly to a lot of our cities and particular regions, and that's, that's the drought package and where things stand. Um, Michael Martin, you should have seen him just pop on your screen. He turned his camera on. Michael is the lobbyist who has been working the drought package for the LOC and its member cities. Um, Michael, what can you tell us about where things stand with this package, particularly as it relates to our member cities? And I think you're muted. Or Michael, we can't hear your audio. Try again. All right, Michael, I'm going to pivot to somebody else and we'll come back to you while you try and figure out your speaking things. So Nolan, hopefully you're on. <laughs> uh, good, you came on. We can pivot here in local government. So Nolan Plesha is on. He is our telecommunications and broadband lobbyist. Many of you have heard from him quite frequently over federal funding that we have coming our way and the assistance he needs from you guys to make this work. Um, so Nolan, where do we stand? I know we've got some surveys out there that you've been asking people to fill out, but what is it the membership needs to know about your portfolio this afternoon? 
Yeah. First of all, can you actually hear me? Sounds yes, like I it. can okay. hear you. You're good. I promise. Make sure I'm not having good. technical issues. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll start with the broadband front. Um, so over the last few weeks, folks may realize I've been saying out a lot of notifications about community broadband listening sessions that have been happening across the state. Uh, these listening sessions were open to public officials as well as the public in general to really help them form uh, what the state needs to do to create the statewide broadband plan uh, that is necessary for the state to apply for the broadband uh, equity access and deployment funding that was passed under the IJA. And just for some context, um, this funding originally was expected anywhere from 500 uh, up to $500 million dollars. Uh, recent projections based off of challenges that some cities might have gone through, uh, as well as the state, we've actually increased the number of unserved areas that are identified, uh, which is a good thing in terms of the allocation, uh, and it's projected the state might receive an additional $200 million on top of what we were already projected. So between that, ARPA, and other sources, we could be receiving up to $900 million uh, for broadband infrastructure projects. The vast majority of this will be really focused in our unserved areas of the state and the additional funding from that will go to unserved areas. So these listening sessions are really to help them for the plan for how we spend that money uh, so that they really understand what are the barriers that and challenges that cities are facing uh, to make sure that uh, their communities are well served uh, in getting this funding. So on top of that, uh, there are some surveys, and that's what is included in this week's bulletin. Uh, these surveys, there's five of them, uh, and they should be short questionnaires that are really focused on uh, the city perspective to really understand those challenges and barriers. Uh, and then there is one additional survey that's really meant for the public. I do separate these out in the bulletin. So if you all have the ability to share that public one with your community, whether it's on social media, newsletters, et cetera, um, it's really good for them to hear from the public as well. But the feedback I've heard from the broadband office is they really wanna hear from cities. These surveys are a great way for you all to give your input without having to uh, necessarily attend these meetings. And for those of you who were not able to, this is a really good way to give your feedback. So. Uh, all the links for each of these surveys are um, on today's bulletin. Uh, after I finish speaking, I'll include the link to the website, and you can find all of the links for each of these surveys under the What tab at the very bottom. Uh, but again, just look at today's bulletin. That's where all those surveys are. I would highly encourage as many folks to fill those out. These The answers to these will help the broadband office uh, in their decision for how they're going to deploy this infrastructure funding. So it's really critical our voices are heard on that. So please, if you have time, uh, no matter the size of your cities, uh, please uh, fill these out or have someone within your community fill those out. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about today is House Bill 2049. This is the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence Bill. Uh, there has really been no known opposition to this bill all session. Um, and uh, passed out of the Joint Information and Management uh, or Joint Information Management and Technology Committee early on in session. Uh, it was unanimously supported, but is essentially sitting in the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, the Center of Excellence, the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, is being stood up by Portland State along with OSU and U of O. And originally, as designed, was supposed to work with all of our uh, additional community colleges and universities throughout the state to provide uh, uh, cybersecurity threat assessments uh, and help for local government. Um, this week, uh, we finally got an indication of what the co-chairs are willing to fund for that bill, uh, which was a significantly reduced uh, amount than we were originally asking for. So in this new uh, reduction, it's now limiting uh, the, the center to just the three main universities with the op optional choice for other uh, higher educational institutions to join. In future sessions, we are hoping to get more funding to expand this out because uh, we know that a lot of our, our big three universities are not easily accessible for many of our communities and we do want this to have a statewide wide reach. Um, that being said, uh, local governments will still have the ability, no matter where they are, to work with the uh, Center of Excellence uh, to do these kind of threat and ass assessments and analyses for their communities. Um, on top of that, there's a workforce development portion. 
to really help us create the uh, cybersecurity workforce uh, uh, for now and into the future by incorporating students into this process so they can really build that real world experience so that after they graduate, they will have the ability to, whether it's going to local government space, government in general, or in the private sector, they will have be building that experience. And right now the state is already short about 7,700 uh, cybersecurity workers. Um, so this is really good news. And within the current bill, one of the things they did is they made sure to provide funding to keep that stood up. So those are some of the uh, good and negative aspects of it. One piece that I'm significantly concerned about is on top of the Cybersecurity Center of Excellent, Excellence, we asked for uh, $3.1 million in matching funds for the federal state and local cybersecurity grant program that was passed under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, it requires uh, matching funds from the state to collect the federal funding. For the first round that was last year, the state didn't have any matching funds uh, available because we did not pass that in the previous short session. So we were able to apply for a waiver so that we didn't have, we could still collect that funding without actually putting out the matching funds. Uh, the feds have been very clear that they're not going to accept any more waivers after that first round. So not including the matching funds in this bill um, uh, in, in the recent allocation uh, is uh, very disappointing. So I've already had conversations with the speaker's office to make sure to highlight this. The next round will come up in September. Uh, and the the good news is that they did ask whether or not the e-board was a possibility as a place to provide those matching funds. So I think we have uh, some paths forward to ensure that we have the funding ready uh, for when the state needs to apply for the federal, um, local, uh, state and local cybersecurity grant funding. Um, and uh, as the bill stands right now, I think it's in a really good place to get the center stood up. It will require some future advocacy to make sure that it uh, remains whole and that it goes further to the original intent in the bill. Um, so while I would love to have those matching funds right now, uh, I think we have a path forward. I'm excited that we're at least finally getting the center set up because I think this will be a big help for a lot of our local governments. Thanks, Nolan. Two quick follow-ups from my end. Is there anything that the members could do to help make that match more likely, or is it just a pause for them and we'll revisit this later? I think that's a it's a pause for them right now. It's a good question. Um, I think for right now it's a pause. I, we're not going to be able to make any changes. I, I was told that very explicitly. Uh, we're not going to make any changes before the end of session. Um, granted, we don't know what the end of session is going to look like. If there are budget bills uh, in a special session, that's another possibility where we can get that funding as well. So I think we have a few um, chances to ensure that we get this funding. The e-board would be our final backstop um, to do most likely in September. Um, but uh, I think when it comes time, what we'll probably ask for members to reach out and just remind legislators that this is a very important piece uh, because this funding is specifically directed to you, to cities. So we need to make sure that the state's providing that funding so that we can get all that federal funding. Thank you, Nolan. And um, just a reminder for the survey stuff, Nolan's going to put those in the chat if you didn't want to read the bulletin this week. So you'll see that um, before you hang up with us here today. We're going to pivot to economic incentives. Um, so Lindsay Tennis, most of you should have known her. She's been talking a lot about all kinds of economic development tools um, we've been working to make sure you retain in your toolbox this year. So Lindsay, what can you tell us where are things standing right now with some of the economic incentives that you've been working on all session? Yeah, thank you, Patty. Um, so the bill that I have recently been talking about is House Bill 2009, um, which right now is serving as an omnibus bill for local economic development incentives, um, including enterprise zones and the strategic investment program, along with the accompanying gain share program, um, as well as the R&D tax credit. Um, so this was an alternative proposal on the House side to Senate Bill 1084, which LOC um, has been supporting. Uh, we saw kind of a flurry of amendments come up with 2009 this week um, and another public hearing yesterday morning. Uh, so the 
the dash four and the dash sevens kind of became the most relevant amendments. Uh, notably, in the dash four, there were some positive improvements. It uh, maintained the gain share cap rather than cutting it down. Um, and this is the maximum amount that a gain share distribution can be sent to any county, um, which also is often shared with the participating sponsoring cities of those strategic investment program agreements. Um, another big change on enterprise zones um, was a change to the transparency requirements. So on enterprise zones, I think there has been concern and some, some voices that have wanted more public participation or the chance for constituents to know what is happening in their enterprise zones um, and to know the sort of negotiations that are happening around these property tax abatements to bring in investment. Uh, the original proposal in House Bill 2009 was requiring zone sponsors to post those applications or agreements uh, for 30 days before they can be finalized. And we heard concern from some cities that that would reduce the incentive because some companies won't want their competitors to know that they're applying to move or to expand um, and also could potentially violate some confidentiality of the terms of agreement. Uh, so the dash four changed that requirement to a 21 day posting notice um, and then explicitly stated that the terms of the agreement do not include the company name or any confidential and proprietary information. Um, so I think that's a market improvement since the first transparency requirement that we have seen. Um, it also extends enterprise zones out to 2032, which is a vast improvement, um, even if it's two years beyond the 2030 sunset that we have been seeing in previous iterations. I think that gives more certainty to these programs um, and the ability for cities to do some more long-term economic development planning. Um, and I would say the big question mark on enterprise zones right now that is still being negotiated um, is what a school district fee will look like. So some of the school organizations have raised concerns that enterprise zones um, negatively impact other communities because of the way that our state school fund formula works out. Um, every student approximately gets the same weighted number or weighted dollar amount in the school district based on our state school fund formula. Um, and so the, the original mechanism to, I guess, deal with this um, was requiring companies to pay on the school district portion of their property tax abatement after a certain number of years. For the standard enterprise zone agreement, it was in year four and five, and then in the long-term agreements after year five. Um, so that would be years six through 15 of a long-term rural abatement. In the dash four, that was changed to a requirement um, for schools to have a seat at the table for the negotiations to come up with a school fee. Um, that seemed like an improvement on our end. It gave local option and a chance for schools and local governments to negotiate about what a reasonable school contribution should be. I think then we learned that that was kind of placeholder language because um, the Legislative Revenue Office and the Revenue Chair were trying to figure out a way to require the school district portion to be paid that didn't run afoul of Measure 5 and 50. Um, so then the Dash 7 was released yesterday afternoon, and we saw this kind of funky formula um, that would require companies to pay a school fee based on the average weighted student attendance of the local school district um, and a portion of the property value and some rate, which has yet to be seen what will be put in for that dollar amount rate. Um, but we've heard that the, the policy goal that 
at least the revenue chair is trying to reach is figuring out how to leave schools untouched from these property tax abatements. Um, so we are trying to work with the Senate finance chair to push this towards an interim work group conversation. I think we're at a place where we can accept the other enterprise zone changes. Um, you know, if if what's on the line is our enterprise zone extensions, the other changes that have been proposed are not harmful enough for us to walk away from our extensions. Um, and we are really pushing for an, a work group conversation on this school fee portion um, and just trying to make sure that any school fee portion does not reduce the incentive enough to no longer make it a viable option for cities and economic development. Um, it's kind of hard to know what's happening right now because a lot of these conversations are happening really quickly and moving very fast and it's been hard for us to know what this formula will end up being or what even the policy goal is for this school district fee um so we're we're trying to kind of move as fast as we can in understanding where this is going uh we've heard there may be a work session on this bill monday um but it could get pushed out even longer than that if the work isn't ready. And I think another message that we're trying to send is to not pass something without knowing what the policy implications are, especially if a proposed formula could run into measure 50 complications. Um, I think, as you all know, our property tax system is incredibly complicated. So we just want to make sure that we understand um, all the facets of what could happen with this kind of change. Um, so, yeah, as I said, House Bill 2009 may have a work session this coming Monday. Um, we have not seen another amendment yet. I could see one at some time over the weekend, um, but it's a little, a little up in the air right now. Um, and I would say, besides the school fee portion, with these economic development incentives, we have been able to get this bill in a much better place um, and have had in particular Senator Meek has been a really strong advocate for these programs um, and has been able to push the bill in a more positive direction. Thanks, Lindsay. And so do you need anything from the members on supporting the work session or work group idea for the school fee portion? Or do you feel pretty comfortable where you are now that everybody can just kind of hang tight and see how things shuffle out next week? Yeah, I would say hang tight because we don't exactly know what we are advocating for or against on that piece yet has been kind of the struggle. Um, so yeah, I think just just hang tight for now and we're um we're trying to respond as quickly as we get information. Perfect. Thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate all your work on this. Um, I have heard that Michael Martin has fixed his technical difficulties, so we're going to try again to give you an update on where things stand with the drought package and how it relates to cities. So, Michael, let's test. Can I hear you? Can you hear me okay? You're good this time. So, Michael, tell us what we need to know about the drought package. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for that, that pivot, Patty. Um, yeah, I just want to give a quick update on uh, some key policy um, priorities in the drought package that got included. And I just want to at least first set that, you know, this was intended to be over a $250 million package and what is now going to be about $110 million. Um, I think if you, you know, if you go back and listen, you'll see that Chair Helm and, and Rep Owens talked about, they brought that up uh, over quarter million because there is a real, real true need. Um, but the, here's what was included that I think is, um, helpful. So first is uh, DAS, uh, the Department of Administrative Services, will enter into a contract with the Oregon Association of Water Til Utilities to provide technical assistance uh, to small and very small community water systems. And some of this technical assistance, I'll just briefly, uh, around infrastructure, uh, funding, financial stability, and water rates, 
and water supply reliability and a lot of different things in there. So that's that's one. Uh, two in drought package, and this is House Bill 2010 um, with the Dash 6 amendments. Uh, number two is that it continues place-based planning. And if you know, this came out of the integrated water resources strategy, and this is a locally led um, basin focused uh, program. So there's funding to continue that along. And then lastly, uh, we have, we've been advocating for ratepayer assistance for water and uh, wastewater utility bills. Uh, this was a first of its kind federal program. Uh, unfortunately, it did not get uh, funded and continued in this program. However, we do have a good foundation and it, uh, LPRO will be doing um, legislative policy uh, office will be doing uh, a study looking at um, you know, different models of ratepayer and water uh, utility assistance. So this will be a conversation going forward into, into future sessions. Um, and then as Ariel had mentioned early on in the call, this, this is uh, what I'm talking about is separate and distinct from the Christmas tree bill, which will have a lot of like funding infrastructure projects and uh, particularly uh, asks to your legislators in it. Thanks, Michael. Follow-up question. I apologize to those on the call if you can hear the massive freight train going behind me at the moment. Um, you talked about um, the Department of Administrative Services being able to help get contracts for technical assistance for small and very small communities. Do we have a population threshold on what those mean? Uh, not in not in the language, but it's it's particularly that DAS will uh, Department of Administrative Services will contract with the Oregon Association of Water Utilities to kind of figure out that universe Perfect. of who that who that is. Awesome. Thank you very much, Michael, and glad um, we were able to get you on today after all. We're gonna pivot um, to our legislative director, Jim McCauley, to kind of help us lead the remaining portion of today's session. So we are getting close to the end of the session. We could be closer than we thought we were. It's kind of a day-by-day -day moment now, as you heard from Scott Winkles at the top of the hour today. But Jim, it's been a long legislative session um, in more ways than one, um, but it hasn't been all bad. From your perspective, how have we fared this session and, and what are some key takeaways that you'd like the membership to understand as we close things out officially here in the next couple of weeks or potentially days? Thanks very much for that, Patty. And I think the first thing I can start off with that I think is important for everybody to understand is that despite having a um, Senate Republican walkout since May 3rd, um, and, and now I think nationally is the longest walkout by any caucus group nationally, as well as obviously in the state of Oregon, is we're still working. Um, we are still going into the office on a daily basis. We are still participating in committee hearings. There is still a lot of active conversation going on with some of those remaining uh, very important policy bills that you've already heard about earlier today, whether it's economic incentives, whether it's something related to housing. And you know, I could go on and on and on because there's a lot of stuff that is stacked up and effectively waiting for the Senate um, to move forward uh, so we can at least try to advance some of these things. So with that being said, we've actually made some progress uh, on a number of bills that uh, provide value to communities out there and something that uh, was a combination of what we had asked for as far as the pre-session filing on a bill, as well as other legislation that we've actually um, joined with partners and things of that nature uh, to advance through the session. So with that, um, we're going to run through real quick um, list of a few bills here, and I'll give my team a chance to do a quick 30, 60 second uh, rundown on what those bills look like. So first up is House Bill 3111. This is a public records exemption that uh, Scott Winkles uh, was on board with. And Scott, before you get on, just real quick, we've got 12 minutes. So when Jim said 30 to 45 seconds, he did mean 30 to 45 seconds so we could have questions because <laughs> I have some waiting for me. <laughs> Got it. Uh, yeah, so this is our public employee privacy and official bill passed, uh, only bill to pass out of the House on the consent calendar uh, in my tenure at the League and uh, uh, passed the Senate on a, on a high margin and it's signed into law. So uh, we've closed this, this loophole and uh, did it with uh, uh, some unexpected, uh, with unexpected ease. So okay. good bill. Got, got it got passed. Great. And Scott, you've actually got the next two. So both House Bill 
um, 812, or actually that should be a Senate Bill 812. Senate Bill 812. Yeah, that's the drone bill. So parks, uh, that is also, I believe that has also been signed into law. And uh, uh, as of January 1, cities can, enter, can pass ordinances or resolutions to regulate, prohibit uh, drone uh, drones in their parks. And so always happy to deliver for our parks and rec folks. And your final bill is uh, Senate Bill 340, retail theft. I really like this bill. Um, as a, <laughs> uh, I'll just preface that this is the this is the organized retail theft bill. Uh, it uh, allows uh, it gives prosecutors a whole bunch more tools, increases sanctions uh, for people who engage in sort of this this organized or or conspiratorial group uh, theft so that's harming our economic vitality. And uh, uh, great, want to give a tremendous amount of uh, credit to the city of Tigard for their efforts in in helping get this bill passed. Right. Thanks very much. So the next two really are with Michael's portfolio, and one is uh, House Bill 3097. That's the in-conduit hydroelectric bill. And then the other one is Senate Bill 123. So Michael, take it away on your two. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Jim. I'm coming. There. There we go. Having, just having some issues today. Yeah. So first, uh, House Bill 3097. Uh, as as Jim mentioned, this is in pipe hydro. This actually passed the House and the Senate unanimously. And effectively what this bill allows, and I think is a good model for our membership to like think about uh, overall, is that it removed barriers. So previously, if you wanted to do any of these projects, you had to go through a longer, more lengthy application process, i.e. the person with the water right had to do that. So this actually removes that. All you need is effectively permission to do it, and you can work on these uh, in-pipe hydro projects if they if they make sense. And then lastly, uh, the Senate Bill One Two Three is a you know great bill. It sailed through. It comes out of the uh, Recycling Modernization Act, and it requires that producer responsibility organizations. Um, produce uh, digital labeling. Um, and what this effectively will help with is um, recyclability claims and making sure that consumers know what is able to recycle. So there's a lot of work to do on that, but that's a great bill that passed this session. Great. Thank you. And I'll wrap it up with um, basically a four session effort, and that would be photo radar. So that's House Bill 2095. So instead of just 10 cities having access to both mobile and fixed radar, every city now has the authority to utilize those tools to deal with traffic management and speed management. So that's kind of where we're at right now, um, where we've had some success. And like I said, on the front end of this, there is a whole lot of um, legislative work that's stacked up waiting for some decision space from governor, from the leadership and wherever we go next. Jim, I want to touch on something you finished with Fodar Radar. That took us four sessions, but we did get the win. We just had to be patient. Is that fair? Yeah, I think um, it's it's the it's the three P's, right? I think we heard that earlier this week from um, from Mayor on the Coast. It's the persistence, it's uh, patience, and it's being a pest uh, effectively in the process. And so, if I could just to kind of give a recap. Jim, just quickly, we have a few minutes. It's important to not think as one session as the end all be all based on this, right? Like what if we didn't get a full win this session, that doesn't mean we're done. We're going to carry through a lot of the things we've been working on in future sessions. Is that fair? That's exactly right. I mean, that's part of the patience aspect on this thing. And it's also part of that persistence as well, because even something that seems as simple, we'll say as photo radar that presents value, presents safety for communities. Again, it took a while to get it through a window. More complex bills um, can take longer, but that's part of what we do. Thank you, Jim. And thank you to all the lobbying team. Um, I would normally try and tell you that the finish line is in sight, but if we might be facing a short session or a special session, that's probably not true. Um, but we're still here. We've got some time for questions. Ariel, I think the first question is actually going to come up for you. It's in the chat. It's from Mayor Rod Cross of Toledo. Um, it is related, I think, to the Homelessness Task Force as well as state funding for OCHS. His question, Ariel, is should we be reaching out to OHCS about our capital contract construction requests as long along with our one pagers related to the task force? That's a great question. Thank you, Mayor. Yes. Uh, I think one thing to know is that uh, in terms of capital construction, um, that's another end of session bill we're waiting to see. And so if you have 
if you have those requests in with your specific legislators, um, you may want to see if that comes out, if that gets granted uh, in the end of session uh, allocations and awards. Uh, if your capital construction requests are specific to shelter, OHCS has some funding for that now in the emergency order. So that's time when you want to let them know that information sooner than later if you're talking to them. Um, and then if you have a request that's related to affordable housing development or something else uh, that's not specific to shelter, they're not necessarily going to know what funding they have for the next week or until budgets are finalized in a special session. So just keep that in mind. I don't think it's it's never too early to kind of reach out and understand um, what, what your options are, but they also have um, competitive funding processes for some of their other resources for development specifically. And so um, it's always good to know kind of the cycle for those. Um, but if you if you um, haven't, if you don't have a contact at the agency and want to know who to talk to about it, feel free to ask me. But also if you if you're talking to folks and if it's specific, especially if it's related to shelter and homeless uh, response, then absolutely um, share that information with OHCS sooner than later. Thanks, Ariel. And I did originally see a hand up from Greg Hinkleman, the city administrator for CLATS. Can I, Greg, if you still have your question and you unmuted yourself and turn your camera on, so I'm assuming you do, please feel free to ask. Okay, it, it relates to the capital construction. I've got a, a, a an ask in and I'm just trying to figure out uh, when we're going to know if my ask is included in what bill um, and uh, keeping my fingers crossed for, for that money. Any idea when we're going to see? see that, uh, that whatever bill it is that has the capital construction request in? Um, I can take a swing at this. Feel free to check in with the rest of my team here. So you have a basically Christmas tree bill or a programmatic. You have a series of different bills, I'll just say, at the end of the session, which could involve just straight on capital construction related. It could be a programmatic change bill. It could be Christmas tree bill. We're going to find out numbers soon. Uh, we should know, I'll say sometime next week, um, where some of those details emerge. So rest of my team, has anybody heard as of today what we're looking at for numbers yet? Not for numbers, but one thing I was just going to say is if you're working with your local legislator, uh, reach out to them. If they were the ones that helped submit that ask, uh, check in with them. They sometimes have updated information well before anybody else does. So I would highly encourage you just check with whoever your champion is for your capital construction ask. Okay, thanks guys. We've got about three and a half minutes left. Um, I will give people an opportunity to ask a question. There are at least two things I do, or three things I really want to tout to the membership. First, if you have found these webinars helpful this session um, and you're interested in seeing, you know, kind of a comprehensive, all-inclusive look of what's transpired over the last six months, um, please make sure you sign up for the third quarter small cities meeting. Um, all of our lobbyists will be going around the state during the third quarter of this year to give a legislative update at the small cities meetings. Now, historically, small cities are anything less than 75 500 in population. However, given the nature of this particular update, if you are larger than 7,500, please feel free to come to this meeting so that you can get a comprehensive assessment of what transpired during this long legislative session. You can register for those small city webinars. They are, in fact, open for registration now. You can do that on our website at www.orcities.org. If you go to our trainings tab, you'll clearly see where you can find it quite quickly. Please make sure to register for that. The other thing, I know many of you are new to local government or you're sitting on council with people who are new to local government or because of staffing changes, you have new staff who are just getting into city government. We will be rolling out a municipal fundamentals training class. These are in-person trainings. They're happening in six locations across the state. They will begin in August and they will cover home rule, social media, public contracting, and how you can handle a difficult council meeting or board meeting. These are going to be held in Vail, Echo, Coquille, Forest Grove, Salem, and Redmond. They are half-day trainings, which will include lunch for a cost of $30. And then last, for those of you that are veteran LOC members and regularly like to go to conference and particularly like to register the day conference opens because you desperately want to stay at the conference hotel, note that the conference will open on July 13th. So we expect to open registration on July 13th, which is approximately a month away. The annual conference this year will be October 12th through the 14th in Eugene at the Graduate Hotel. We look forward to seeing all of you there. 
We're still not sure where we stand with the legislative session. So for now, I can't tell you if this was our last LEP webinar or if we have more to come, but please make sure that you follow the bulletin and keep track of your emails that come from the league staff. And if we need to have more webinars, we will. That will also be true during a special session if one is called. So for now, it's Friday, it's one minute till one. Um, I hope all of you are not like us here at the league who will be working all weekend and instead that you can have a nice Saturday and Sunday and enjoy your time off. Thanks for everything you do for your cities, your communities, um, and the assistance you provide us when we work on your behalf. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you.